Today we're going to be looking at the short chapter in Yeshayahu, chapter 20. It's a very short chapter. Only contains six verses. That's a short chapter. But as you know, as I have said over and over again, and also the writer of the article of WordPress had noted from which we read from that chapters and verses were not something that the prophets were concerning themselves with. But theologians came up with that as a way of being able to somehow order the scriptures so that we could better find them and also separate content. So here we're in the 20th chapter of Yeshayahu. We're going to read the entire chapter, which contains six verses. So if you go with me in the text, as I'm reading from the Septuagint, And as you know, I say this over and over again, the text I'm reading from is probably going to have words in here that are different from what you have, but I will be um, noting those particular differences as we read through the text. Verse 1 of chapter 20. In the year when Tanaphan or Tartar came to Azotus or Ashdod when he had or when he was sent by Arna or Sargon king of the Assyrians and warred against Azotus and took it then Yahuwah spoke to Isaiah or Yeshayahu the son of Amos saying, Go and take the sackcloth off thy loins and loose thy sandals from off thy feet and do this going naked and barefoot. I'll say it again if you didn't get it. Going naked and barefoot. And Yahuwah said, as my servant Isaiah Yeshayahu has walked naked and barefoot three years, there shall be three years for signs and wonders to the Egyptians, Mitzrayim, and Ethiopians, Cushim, or the Cushites. For thus shall the king of the Assyrians lead the captivity of Egypt, O Mitzrayim, and the Ethiopians, Cushim, young men and old, naked and barefoot, having the shame of Egypt exposed, and the Egyptians, being defeated, shall be ashamed of the Ethiopians, in whom they had trusted. For they were in their glory, or for they were their glory. I'm going to read verse 5 again. And the Ethiopians being defeated shall be ashamed of the Ethiopians, in whom they had trusted, for they were their glory. And they that dwell in this island, the term island literally should be coastland. And they that dwell in this island or coastland shall say in that day, Behold, we trusted to flee to them for help. Who could not save themselves from the king of the Assyrians? And how shall we be saved? Let us pray. 
Avinu Mokenu, we do bless you and thank you for this opportunity to provide this teaching. I ask for wisdom, your kokma and guidance so that I may present the scripture in a manner that suits you. May your voice be heard in the teaching, Abba Yah. And may your people be edified and built up in their faith. I do bless you and thank you. May you be glorified in all things through the mighty name of Yahshua, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Before we begin to get into chapter 20, it is important that we reflect for a moment the things that the Most High declared concerning Mitzrayim or Egypt in the latter part of the 19th chapter. As you know in chapter 19 that that chapter has concerned itself primarily with the word of Yah to Egypt or Mitzrayim. The first section primarily of the 19th chapter had to do with the demise of Egypt. The second part of that chapter had to do with the spiritual restoration of Egypt. But when we look at the second part of the 19th chapter, and as the Most High was speaking concerning two things about the relationship that would be shared with Egypt, Israel, and Assyria. He noted how that there would be a situation in which the Assyrians would have a alliance of sorts with both Egypt and Israel and the particular prophecy that Yeshayahu was giving had to do with what would be seen in the Messianic Kingdom age. But he also gave another prophecy right next to it where it reflected Egypt being taken into captivity by the Assyrians. And how the Assyrians would come down into Egypt and would take captives from Egypt back to Assyria. So with the backdrop of that information from the latter part of the 19th chapter, it leads us into chapter 20. And as it leads us into chapter 20, what we're seeing is a continuation of what Yah is doing or will do to the Egyptians. But we are also seeing how that Yah is going to also bring about a punishment or judgment upon the nation that Egypt was serving which is Cush at that particular time. Now what's interesting about this 20th chapter when you look at the first verse because you know a lot of times the way information is introduced you have to look at it to understand what Elohim is trying to do. So in the first verse it says that in the time or in the year when Tartan, that's what it says in your Bible, Tonophan is what it says here, came to Ashdod, the Lazarus, and took it. This was a 
pivotal point when you concern yourself with time and events. The capturing of cities, the taking over of kingdoms, those are all pivotal points because these particular events are always written down in history somewhere. So the writer here marks a particular event, not for the sake of bringing importance to the event, because we don't get any more detailed information about this event. It's just a marker. It's like saying, y'all remember when the Twin Towers blew up? When we hear that term, Twin Towers, we know that that is an event in time that everyone's familiar with, that affected everyone. But then we will give that marker to denote our interactions with another person on that particular day or that particular, you might say, you know, in the year that the Twin Towers, you know, came down, we went to Hawaii, or, or we did this, or we did that, or we had this conversation. But the focus is on what the two individuals were doing, not the Twin Towers. So in verse 1, verse 1 is a marker. You'll notice what it says here when we look at it. When this happened, that the Assyrians had took Azotus or Ashdod, this is when Yahuwah spoke to Yeshayahu. He wanted to lay a marker down. He wanted to say, okay, y'all know, y'all remember when this happened? Yah spoke to Yeshayahu, and he's about to tell him to do something that's very peculiar, y'all. Yeah. He's about to tell him to do something that's very shameful, y'all. <laughs> but he gives a marker. Because he wanted everybody to know. Y'all remember when that happened? Because the Assyrians were doing a whole lot of stuff coming through. Because they, they were like, look, we're going to take over all these kingdoms. That king had in his mind, I'm going to take all the nations and I'm going to make them mine. That's what he said. He thought he was unstoppable. And so, the most I spoke to, the prophet. When you get into verse 2, verse 2 tells us what the Almighty told the prophet to do. The prophet was told to remove his garment from his loins. Everybody know what loins are? That's this bottom half of your body where you cover your private area and your backside. He said, take the garment off and take your sandals off. Now, I want you to display yourself for three years. Wait a minute. Three years. Is this y'all speaking? Is, is, it, is this y'all who are giving this information? He's telling him to go naked for three years? Expose, your, expose yourself for three years? I'm about to be honest with y'all, see y'all. <laughs> I'd probably be questioning, is, is this really y'all talking? Is this, this the most high talking? I'd be, I'd be like, wait, 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 wait. Is this, you know, because this, this just sounds kind of, woo, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Out there. What it says about the prophet is that the prophet had a keen sense of hearing and knowing Elohim's voice. Mm -hmm. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. There are many folk out there that call themselves prophets, but they don't always have a keen sense of hearing and knowing Elohim's voice. Yes. This prophet knew Elohim's voice so well that when God told him to do something that would be very, very questionable, we would never tell anybody, you know what, take your clothes off and go straight down the street. We never say that. Do it for three years. <laughs> what? I just want I just want to sit with you for a while. 
I want, I want to sit with you for a while. Because Yah is telling him to do something to provide a message with regard to what would befall the nations of Egypt and Ethiopia. Prophet Yeshayahu was prophesying primarily to the southern kingdom. Even though a great deal of his prophecy had a lot to do with the northern kingdom, he was prophesying to or giving the information to the southern kingdom, the king of the southern kingdom. Now, if y'all don't believe me, let's go to Yeshayahu chapter 1, and we'll confirm that. Yeshayahu chapter 1, verse 1. What does it say? The vision of Yeshayahu, the son of Amos, saw, which he saw against Yehuda and against Jerusalem in the reign of Uzziah and Yotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, who reigned over Yehuda or Judea. And when he was prophesying, all of that information that we have been going through, he was speaking to the king of Yehuda. So here he is called of Elohim to display his naked self in Judea. And the Most High declared and said that this is going to serve, notice, as a sign and a wonder for the Egyptians and the Ethiopians. So the prophet went about three years naked and barefoot in humiliation to demonstrate what was going to befall the Egyptians, Mitzrayim, and the Ethiopians, the Cushites. For the Assyrians would come and take captives of Mitzrayim or the Egyptians and Cushim or Cush, the Ethiopians, and lead them away naked and barefoot in great humiliation and in shame. The prophet was to provide a message, a prophetic message through the display of his naked body. Who? I tell you what, the Most High does some unusual stuff to get his message across. I read another place one time where the prophet told, or when the Most High told the prophet Ezekiel, I believe it was, he said, I want you to make some cakes. <laughs> he said, when you make these cakes, you're going to include human dung in the cakes. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember that. I'm like, my goodness. That's unclean. That's an abomination. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know how some folk, they want to talk about, well, you know, I'm a yacht change. You know, you, you can eat whatever you want to eat. You know, and I know that the most high can do whatever he wants to do. I know that the Most High can, can change whatever he wants to change, and if he makes certain things clear, I'm good with that, if he does that. But sometimes there are some special situations where the Most High is trying to get a message across, and he might tell one of his servants to do a particular thing. That don't mean that Yah has changed his commandments. Come on, talk to me, Israel. Got some brethren, they feel like, well, you know, Peter said that when that sheep was let down and y'all said, go kill and eat. Y'all changed everything then. You can eat whatever you want to eat. No, he didn't. No, no, no. The Catholics were the ones that came along and took advantage of that change. 
or shall I say, took advantage of that situation in the text and introduced a change whereby all of the Western Christian church now eats unclean animals. Notice I didn't say unclean food. I said unclean animals. You know why? Because the word food in the scripture, in the scripture, means that which is permitted for consumption. Hello, somebody. That's what the word food means in the scripture. That which is permitted for consumption. So whatever y'all permits for his people to eat, that's what's called food. Not what's edible, not what's consumable. Everything is consumable. You consumable. Everything is consumable now. You can be food to me if I want you to be food to me. But if y'all hasn't declared it to be food, it's not food. I know y'all, I know, I know, I know folk don't want to go with me there. But you see, y'all has a tendency sometimes to tell his prophets to do some stuff that in regular instances, it's like, no, nah, you're not supposed to be doing that. It's like if, if, if one of you beautiful ladies was to come out of your mind and decide, I'm just going to, you know, drop all of my clothes off and I'm going to parade myself around to get some attention. You say, now, overseer, you really reaching out there. This kind of stuff goes on, y'all, in the world. Y'all hearing me, right? It goes on in the world. There's public displays of this. Now, that's sinful. That's wrong, right? So that's not something that you would do on the norm. Well, look, he told, he told the prophet to go and take his clothes off, so... Uh, why can't I? <laughs> you know, you got some weird, freaky people in the world. I'm just, I'm, I'm just saying. No, I'm, I'm, I'm being honest with you. I'm being very, very honest with you. You do. So I got to kind of help to level this out so we understand that just because y'all told the prophet to do that doesn't give permission doesn't give permission, y'all listening to me? Doesn't give permission for people who are debauched to think, now, well, it's in the Bible. <laughs> and some of us say, no, people won't do that. Yeah, people do do that. And people have done that. There's some crazy folk in the world. That's why I'm saying this. And there's some nutty folk even in the congregations. You say, no, they're not people. Yes, there are some nutty, crazy people in the congregation. There are people that are slipping among us unawares and they sing with you. They clap their hands with you. But their minds need deliverance. Yes. Mm -hmm. Father, I didn't know I was going to say that and I don't know why. Maybe somebody out there might need it. Maybe somebody watching us on my live stream might need to hear that. I don't know. But there are a lot of people who look in the scripture and misappropriate the scripture when they see something like this. You got people who are justifying same sex relationships by things they read in the text and say, well, well what about David and Jonathan? Because they had a close friendship. So I'm just trying to help us to understand. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying to keep some balance in the midst of all of this. You know, I know I might make y'all laugh or whatever, but I'm trying to help us to understand the reality of things. And sometimes y'all may use some unusual situations to bring about a point. But he's Elohim and he's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants to do. That's right. Regardless of what I think or believe, regardless of what I feel, regardless of how shameful it may sound. Because you know, some of us, you know, we so sanctified, you know, it's like, oh no, I can't see that. Like they've never seen a naked body before. 
Hello. But the message that the prophet was giving was to demonstrate how that Egypt and Ethiopia were going to be taken as captives by Assyria. Mm -hmm. This is what the message was indicating. And it was indicating the shame that the Egyptians would have because they would be taken, as we've read in the article during the history bit, how they were chained and they were taken as a chain gang. But they were naked and barefoot when they were taken as captives. Right. Now in the text we'll read in verse 5, here's where we get the clue that Egypt was under Ethiopian rule. Because the text says that the Egyptians were going to be ashamed of the Ethiopians because they had trusted in them. And Ethiopia was their glory. During that time in history, Ethiopia had power over Egypt. So the world don't always want to talk about the power that Ethiopia had over the land of Ham mm -hmm. in those ancient times. But just to give you an idea, Cush had all of southern, what we call southern Africa, not South Africa, everything that is below Egypt and Libya belonged to Cush. I want to give you an idea of that. So that's all of what we would call Central Africa, West Africa, and South Africa. All of that belonged to Cush. Yes, yes. Yahshua referred to the queen of Sheba as being the queen of the South. Yes. Because all of that southern continent belonged to Cush. And they understood that in the ancient times. Cush had a large landmass and territory. Mm -hmm. And they also had great power. That's not always discussed. Many books are written about Ethiopia. Many, many books. I've got one that's called The Wonderful Ethiopians. Amongst a number of other books that I have. And it talks about all of what the Ethiopians have done and going all over the world. First Cushite king in the world after the flood. Do y'all know who he was? Y'all don't know, do you? Because most people don't highlight it. Nimrod. His daddy was Cush. Y'all don't want to go there with me. Okay. All right. So what we see going on here is how the Most High was about to cripple the power of Ethiopia and Egypt. Since Egypt was responsible for trying to bring down Yehuda and Israel, and since they were under the authority of Ethiopia at this particular time, the Most High was going to hit both of them. But Egypt was ashamed because Egypt thought, look, this mighty empire that we are serving, we are expecting for them to rise up and to push back the Assyrians. But they could not do it. So they were ashamed, as the text says. But although we see all of this going on and the focus being on Assyria coming in and taking captives of Egypt and Ethiopia, the real deal message was to Judah. The real message that the prophet was presenting was to Judah. The message that Yah was trying to get to Yehuda was that 
Stop trusting in human governments. Stop trusting in human kingdoms. When you find yourself with an enemy coming to you and you are stressed by the thought of being overtaken and being made captives, instead of going down to Egypt immediately, because that is what Yehuda's first go-to has always been. Let's go down to Egypt. Let's go down and get help from Egypt. We got brethren down in Egypt. We got brethren down in Ethiopia. Heck, most of the Ethiopians down there was practicing the religion of Israel to begin with. Let's go down there. Let's go get assistance. What Yah said is, stop going to others to find deliverance. You need to come to me. You need to depend on me. You need to pray to me. You need to get my counsel. Amen. The message was directed to Yehuda. That's what this was all about. When we look at verse 6, we read in the text, and you know it says the term island. Much of the time when translators of scripture are translating, they don't always get it right in the English. But verse 6 is directed by the prophet to the southern kingdom, Yehuda, in that message. Let's read it again in verse 6. I want you to see. In verse 6 it says, And they that dwell in this, where it says island, it literally is supposed to be coastland. It is the land of that is boundary by the waters. Coastland. And it says, And they that dwell in this coastland shall say in that day, Behold, we trusted to flee to them for help. This is Jehovah speaking with regard to their plans to go down to Egypt and to get help because of the Assyrians that were coming in. And listen to what they say. Behold, we trusted to flee to them for help who could not save themselves from the king of the Assyrians. So they're saying, now look, how are we now going to get help when the ones that we trusted in to help us, which was Egypt, have now been taken into captivity by the Assyrians? And notice what they say. And how shall we be saved? This question, how shall we be saved, it reveals a whole lot. It's very telling. Because what, it, what it's saying is that the leadership of the southern kingdom had trusted so much in the power of man and in the power of human governmental systems and powers and military for their deliverance that when they saw their ally go down they immediately plunged into hopelessness mm -hmm. this is not the attitude of a people that has their hope anchored in the sovereign most high Yahuwah of the universe. Yes, yes. Here the prophet is speaking to them, giving them all of this information of what is to come. But yet the same attitude persists in Yehuda of trusting in flesh, trusting in man, trusting in the powers that exist. And have completely forgotten that they're being preserved by Yah. And will not even recognize that their stability or that little piece of stability that they had. Not even remembering that the Most High, when Hezekiah was alive, um, hallelujah, saw the deliverance where 180,000 Assyrian troops were immediately slaughtered. And they didn't even have to go into battle. But they still trusted in flesh. 
They still trusted in human power. You know what? It, it baffles my mind how men are. They can see a miracle. They can see the power of Elohim. They can watch situations change. Yes. They can see how they come out of deliverance. And they can hear the stories yes. about what the Almighty had done for their ancestors. Yes. But still, because they believe the voice of the culture, y'all ain't wanting to walk with me today. Because they believe the voice of the culture. They believe the news that they heard. They believe how this king has come in and taken over all of these nations and they begin now to have a distrust in the ability of the one who brought their ancestors into that land and said I'm going to give it to you even though the sons of Anak them giants are in this land and it makes you afraid I'm going to give it to you they lost trust Amen. In the Almighty. Mm. This is not the statement that sons and daughters of Abraham, Isaac, and Yitzhak should have even allowed to come up out of their mouths. Yes, yes. In Egypt is taken. The one who we trust in is taken. How shall we be saved? It's, wait a minute, don't you know who you are? I gotta go there, Zion, because many of us we act the same way. Stuff pop off in our lives and we go through situations and trials and then we go to crying and how's it gonna work out? Nobody got a knife at your throat about to take you out, but you crying over stuff that's going on in your life that's making you uncomfortable. You going going to all these different means, fleshly means, to try to resolve your problems and resolve your situation without realizing that y'all is saying that I'm here. Amen. Why are you going to that particular venue to try to figure out your problems and to try to get your answers? Why are you going to the tarot card reader to try to get some advice about what your next move need to be? Amen. Hello, somebody. Amen. You mean to tell me? That some some folk, believing folk, are going to tarot card readers and diviners because they feel so distraught. I need a word. I need a word. I need a word. I need some direction. Well, y'all already gave you the direction in the script. He gave you the direction in the script. Come on, somebody. And he gave you the direction in the script so as to teach you how to trust him. So that even though you might be going through trial and it might not feel good. You might be facing something that might bring about a challenge that you don't even know how to handle. But y'all is saying lift your hands and praise me. I know how to bring you out. And if I don't bring you out, I'll bring you through it and I'll replace everything you lost. Hallelujah. If the most I have to do you like he did Job, where he Job said that Yahuwah give it and Yahuwah takes away. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of Yahuwah. Yeah. If he got to take you through that road, then just buckle up, baby. Buckle up, my brother, and just go for the ride. But while you're going for the ride, get a dance on. Oh, <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Begin Hallelujah. to realize that he's never left you. Hallelujah. He's never forsaken you. Right. That he has kept yeah. you. He's given you breath. He's given you help. Yeah. He's giving you food and he's watching over you. Some of us don't want to go through nothing. We're measuring our lives by what everybody else is saying. And we want to measure the blessedness of Elohim and keeping and supporting us based on the word of the culture. But I got a word for you today, Zion. You better put your trust in God and none other. Hear not the voice of those who come with a word from the adversary. Amen. Trust only in you yes. Hallelujah. While you might look like a sore thumb in the midst of this one, like an eight ball on a pool table, you might look like the square peg that's not fitting. Yes. Stick with the book. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do what the scriptures declare because Yah will bring you out. Yah will bring you through Hallelujah. and he'll get the glory out of your life. Hallelujah. Come 
Glory. Hallelujah. Glory. Yahuda. Yahuda had forgotten who their deliverer was. See, these are all signs of how a people can become so attached to the world that they are in. That they think like the world. Come on, say that. They make decisions like the world. Mm -hmm. They raise their children like the world. They just position themselves in life like the world. Mm -hmm. They feel like it's more important to know all of the affairs and what's going on around them in the world. I'd rather go pray and talk to my Elohim and bless his name. I still believe, hallelujah, that he is the governor among the nations and that nothing has lost his control or his grip. I don't care what's going on over in Russia with Putin. I don't care what's going on in this debauched land of this American Rome. It don't make no difference to me what's going on over in England. It don't make no difference what's going on over in China. All I'm concerned about is doing what y'all say. Yeah. All I'm concerned about is seeing how Yah's gonna take his people to where he has yes, to take yes, them. Yes, All I'm yes, concerned yes, about, yes. Zion is trying to stay in a position yes, so Yah can use yes. my life. Amen. Hallelujah. He's already said he's gonna take care of me. Hallelujah. So I believe he's gonna take care of me. If yes. he said it, yes. I'm gonna believe it. Amen. I don't have time to be worrying about, oh, well, I got this bill too. I, I got that bill too, and I don't know. I, I'm a little short on my money right now. I don't know how we gonna do this one. Oh, I'm gonna pull my hair out. I, no, I don't got time for that. I don't have time for that. My Elohim is concerned about all of those things that concern me. Mashiach said, "Seek first the kingdom of Elohim and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you." How many of y'all really believe that? Hallelujah. Oh, we can quote it real good. I said, how many of y'all really believe it? How many of you really live it? Hallelujah. Do you really walk it? Do you live like, like, like a person that believes that? Or are you stressing all the time? Hallelujah. I've been there, Zion. I know, it's tough. I made a decision many years ago, and I said, well, y'all, yeah, I'm going to live and act like I have an Elohim. I don't think you caught what I said. Mm -hmm. I'm going to live and act like I have an Elohim. Mm -hmm. You're going to start stressing and worrying. You're living like you do not have an Elohim and you are responding like a pagan. I know that's hard to take. You say, well, see, can you just mellow it down just a little bit? No, I can't. For me, it's best for me not to just say anything instead of mellow something down. My wife would tell you, I'm, you know, I, I have a tendency, I just tell the truth just like it is. Am, am I right, baby? <laughs> Sometimes when you're dealing with people, I've learned that you got to try and be delicate when it comes to the feelings and emotions of people that you love. And sometimes there's a way in which you, uh, you know, have to, you know, order your words to say what you're going to say. But I'm like this, Zion, truth is truth. And I ain't got time to waste to water that truth down. You know why? Because if you don't grab the truth and work with it and perform it, you're going to deal with the consequences. Amen. Hallelujah. That's what it is. I'm not in this thing doing what I'm doing because I'm trying to make a large congregation grow and be seeker friendly and be careful what I say so I don't offend somebody. I love everybody, but I'm going to preach this book. So if the book offends you, then hey, there's nothing I can do about that, Zio. I don't have a problem with someone coming and saying, well, we'll see, you know, I don't, I don't quite agree with what you said. That's fine. I do my best just like everyone to understand the text and what the words mean and how they apply and who they apply to. I do my best to do that. I'm human. I might miss it every once in a while, but I'm going to come back and make a correction and say, Abba, y'all give me wisdom. Abba, y'all give me guidance. Help me to know how to give this word in proportion and right so that Zion would take it and live it and walk it out and receive your covenant blessings in their lives. I believe the covenant. And when the people of Elohim walk in the covenant, let me tell you, when you walk in the covenant, you believe the covenant, you live the covenant, there's something about your language that will not allow you to 
ever say anything that will minimize the impossibility of your Elohim. And this statement that was made by Yehuda is a statement that shows me that they did have not have any trust in Yah anymore. No wonder why the Babylonians came and took them into captivity. And you trusted in everything else. God's right here saying, I'm here. I have the answer. But you keep going to those nations that are worshiping other deities. That don't make no sense to me. And many of us believers, we do that same kind of stuff. You rather go and get your advice from somebody. Woo! All right. <laughs> he bless his name. Sometimes we like to get our advice from those who are of the world who are not thinking about Elohim, who have no biblical Torah-based foundation at all. But we want to get their advice on how to do life. And we wonder why we're in the situations we're in. Well, I just think that they're a professional and they know. You got to be careful with some of these professionals and what they know because they can be giving you advice that's worldly, that's not biblical, and will lead you away from those things that are in the book. You just too Bible oriented, Overseer Dawi. That's right, I am. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'll wear that badge. You know, when people want to talk about, well, they're, they're, they're this and they're that, you know what I do? I say, thank you. It's true. I refuse to compromise with this culture. I refuse to compromise with the age. I refuse to compromise with that which is against the scripture. I refuse. Amen. I'm going to say this and I'm going to close. I saw a video that was rather interesting. Pastor, his name is Jamal Bryant. How many of y'all have ever heard of a pastor by the name of Jamal Bryant? Mm -hmm. He pastors New Birth Missionary Baptist Church in Georgia. He's a well-known preacher. He's preached on Trinity Broadcasting Network many times over the years and their telephones and raising money. He's a great wordsmith. <laughs> well, he took it upon himself to go to a congregation that supports uh, same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. Now, for those who choose that type of lifestyle, that's their choice. I'm not throwing stones at people in particular. I just uphold the standard of the ancient biblical texts. So I'm not trying to throw stones at people who have made choices with regard to how they want to live. However, a person does life, that's on them. You'll have to answer the Almighty for that. But when it comes to ministers who make a statement and say, I'm going to go to this particular religious community that supports LGBTQ, you know. And he went on the behalf of all of the black ministers, that's who he's representing, to apologize for their particular position against the practice of homosexuality, okay? Which the Hebrew scriptures speak against. Now, when you have men like that that are popular in the religious world and they're doing these things, I cannot support that. I will never agree with that. 
And I will never allow anybody to represent me. But that's what we have going on in the world today. And you know why? All because of wanting to be seeker friendly. See, Zion, Messiah came to preach the Besora. And this Besora teaches us that we are to deny wickedness and worldly lust. This Besora teaches us. Read it over in 1 John where it says that sin is the transgression of the law or the Torah. These scriptures teach us that if you want to know what sin is, do what the Torah says you are not supposed to do. That's what sin is, based upon the definition in 1 John. We debate these issues all the time because in our minds as believers, we think, well, it don't take all of that in. And no, well, I didn't write the book. So debate that with Elohim for those of you who have your particular views. But I'm going to be the messenger boy. I'm going to tell it just like it says it. And I'm going to align my life accordingly. I don't care whether I preach in someone's big congregation or not. That don't make no difference to me. I'm not trying to hook up with anything that is not according to what the Torah says. I don't care who you are or what you believe. Whether it's Western Christian or Rabbinic Judaism, if it's not according to what's written in this Torah as was intended by Moshe and Moshiach, I'm not with it, Zio. Mm -hmm. We live in a day to day where we're trusting in so many things, trying to do so many things to make life work instead of just being obedient to the Most High. Life is not about trying to get to a plateau where we can demonstrate, oh, I have this, so I've arrived at the place of being blessed. It's like believers have this idea because Bible teachers want to teach them that you need to be prosperous, and if you don't have this, and if you haven't reached this particular place in life, you're not blessed. Well, blessing means having the support of Yah upon your life. Ma. Ma. Nothing to do. It has nothing to do with how much stuff you've attained. What we need to concern ourselves with is if we have Yah's support on our lives. And just as the Most High spoke to the prophet to give the prophet a message to Judah, telling Judah, listen, don't trust in flesh. Don't trust in the power of other nations. Put your trust in Yahuwah. And I want to encourage you today, Zion. Put your trust in Yahuwah. Yes. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Athena Melcano, we do bless you. And we do thank you for your mercies your kindnesses and your goodness. Yes. I trust that your voice has been heard in the teaching today. Yes. Yes. I pray, Abba, that Zion has received the word and that she is encouraged to trust you, to look to you, to seek you for guidance, to seek you for direction, to seek you for counsel regarding everything that concerns her. And Abba Yah, I pray that if there are any unbelievers that may have been watching, that their hearts have been touched, and that they find Yahshua as being the deliverer and the savior of their souls, may they turn to you in repentance. May they find the joy and the shalom that passes all understanding. Abba Yah, we do thank you for the word. 
We thank you for the prophet. We thank you for his obedience. And we say, Abba, Yah, have your way in our lives. Yes. God, and direct our footsteps. Help us that we might serve you and do those things that are pleasing in your sight. We bless you now in the mighty name of Yahshua. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The most high be praised. Bless you. I trust that you have been encouraged and strengthened in your faith and challenged Hallelujah. to continually trust your Elohim. At this time, we want to prepare our hearts to share in the Shalomim together. Let us offer prayer unto Elohim as we examine ourselves. And most high Yah, we want to thank you for this opportunity that we have to come to share in the Shalomim. And we ask that you search us. We ask that you purge us. Cleanse our hearts and our minds. May the relationships we have with others, Father, be good relationships. We come against all of the strained relationships and pray that you would forgive us if we have caused anything. We pray that you fix relationships among your people. Yeah. We pray, Abba Yah, that you bless us now as we prepare to receive the Shalomim May we be drawn closer to you. May we receive the blessings of the covenant. May we receive good health. May we receive continued prosperity. May we receive the anointing in greater measure that we may be able to be used by you in might and power in every place we may be found. Now, Abba Yah, be glorified. We will give your great name thanks Hallelujah. in the mighty name of Yahshua. Amen. Amen.
this time we ask for those of you who are in the rear, if you will come first and receive up the shalom. Bless Elohim today for our Mashiach being our bread of life and manna from heaven. You may eat the bread. We also bless our Elohim for the spilled blood of our Mashiach, Yahshua, who gave his life so that we might have shalom, shalom, for thy Elohim. We drink the cup. Trust that each one of you have been encouraged and strengthened in your faith. For those of you joining us by live stream, we want to thank you for your participation and trust that you have been encouraged and blessed by the teaching and that you grow in your faith. If there are any offerings or tithings that you may have to give unto our Elohim, you can go to our website at www dot ncmmi dot 20 m dot com and you can donate also you can donate by cash app our cash app code is dollar sign ncmmi and for those of you in the sanctuary that you may have tidings or offerings to present you can place them in the receptacle that is to my right your left or you can also give electronically by going to our website or through Cash App. At this time, we want to speak the final blessing and dismiss ourselves to our Oneg Fellowship Time. Hallelujah. Yeverekika Yahua Beismareka Ya Er Yahua Panal Ileka Vikuneka Yasa Yahua Panal Ileka Shalom. Now may Yahuwah bless you and protect you. May Yahuwah make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahuwah lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. Avinu yeah. shalom aleichem. Our Father's peace be upon you. Shabbat shalom to each of you. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Peace. Amen. 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 Amen.